Good morning. So this is week two, uh, part two of two of our series, Hashtag Blessed. And uh, last time, Karina dove into the topic and looking at all the different ways that people feel blessed. And today we're going to be talking a little bit of uh, a different side of that. And that is primarily about passing on a blessing and uh, mostly to, to our kids. So I want to start off with a, a story of uh, when we lived in St. Catharines, uh, Ontario, before we moved back to Manitoba, we had a family that lived across the street from us that was Jewish. And they uh, very quickly became some of our best friends. And one day, they invited us over uh, for a Shabbat meal. And, and we had often had conversations uh, you know, about Christianity and Judaism with them, and so we, we talked about these sorts of things. So it was, it was very cool to have them invite us over to their house on a Friday night for this uh, very important part of their, their life as, uh, as a Jewish family. So from sundown on Friday to sundown Saturday is the Sabbath, and they kick that off with this, with this meal on Friday night called the Shabbat meal. And they have, uh, you know, different traditional foods that are part of that meal, that have symbolism. And they also have uh, specific prayers and blessings that are part of that. And there's a blessing that uh, they pray for their kids. And it's, uh, it comes from the priestly blessing of Aaron, that Aaron and his sons were supposed to speak over the Israelites. It comes from Numbers chapter 6, which Karina um, spoke of last time. And usually, uh, one of the parents will... Uh, lay a hand on the child's head and say, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Uh, one writer talking about uh, Jewish traditions, uh, Tamara, Tamar Fox says, usually the person giving the blessing um, would place one or both hands on the child's head and after the blessing, some parents would take a moment to, to whisper uh, something personal into their child's uh, ear, like praising him or her for something they, they did that week, or conveying some extra encouragement or love. And then almost every family concludes that blessing with a kiss or a hug. So it was a really cool experience for us to join in uh, with, uh, with our neighbors, and real honor to be included in this, this part of their, their lives. But... This specific kind of ritual probably isn't something that most of us have grown up with, uh, but maybe we had something in our families that was, was similar, some way that we incorporated blessing our kids into our, our uh, families' lives. Uh, maybe there's some kind of routine uh, that you have with your kids. Traditions like this uh, are great, but they only have their fullest meaning when we understand where, where they come from. Why do we follow these kinds of traditions? So I look back at uh, where blessings began in the Bible, and you have to go right back to the very beginning. It starts in Genesis, at the very end of the creation story, God starts uh, this whole tradition with a blessing that he gives to Adam and Eve. Genesis 1 says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then, later on, after the flood, he gives almost that exact, exact blessing to Noah. God blessed Noah and his sons and told them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Then Abraham, or who was going to be called Abraham, while he was still Abram, uh, God came to him and said, leave your native family, or your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So it was God who started this whole practice of blessing his children. And then those children, the patriarchs as we sometimes refer to them, they carried on that practice. 
If you've been reading along in our Bible app reading plan, so if you have the, the Bible app, and actually now it's on the church website as well on the sermons page, you can follow on, along uh, with these readings in preparation for each Sunday. And if you did that this week, you will have read some of these different blessings, the ones that, that God started, and then also like Jacob uh, blessing his sons. And well, before that, Isaac, you know, that's an interesting story in itself of Jacob and Esau kind of fighting over this blessing. And if you've been doing that, you will have read these stories. And there's a pivotal event. Uh, it, well, it's a very pivotal event in each of their lives. Usually one of the things that, kind of the last thing the father did before he knew that his time was coming, before he passed away. But we also read about other examples of blessings. And not only for our own kids. Jesus was never married. He didn't have any children. But parents would bring their children to Jesus to be blessed by Him. So maybe you're not a parent. Maybe you're a father figure or a mother figure in someone's life. Or maybe you're one of the amazing people that are a youth sponsor. Those are some of, the, some of my favorite people that spend time with, with kids. Maybe you're uh, working in a daycare and you have little kids surrounding you all day long that, that look up to you and, uh, and you know, look to you for a, as a role model. So if we're in any one of these scenarios, you know, most of us have some younger person in our life that we are a role model to or involved in in their lives. So how do we go about blessing them? What's, what's involved in all of this? There's a, an alliance pastor in the States named uh, Sean Andrews. I like the way he simplified it into these three simple things. Time, touch, and talk. So let's look at each one of these a little bit closer. When it comes to the first part, with time, spending time with your kids, there's one key element that is really important, and that is to be emotionally available. That means fully engaging, having focused attention with your child. And I'll admit, this is one of uh, my bigger challenges, and with phones in everyone's hands and uh, these days, it, it can sometimes be really hard to just put everything else down and engage and focused attention with our kids. And if you have a job that involves a lot of phone calls or emails or working on your laptop, it can be pretty hard to turn off your work brain and just fully engage with being home and being with your family. And our families, they can, they can tell if we're not really fully all there, if we're thinking about something else in the back of our mind, they know. They always tell me that. They can tell that I'm not listening, so they know. As I listened to a bunch of podcasts on this topic, there was, uh, there was something that kind of kept popping up as something that people suggested would help with this, and that was having a coming home routine. It's something that you do menta- mentally or, or physically to switch gears so that you can be all there when you get home with your family. There was one guy who said that uh, he was a motorcycle rider, so he said on the way home he would just kind of take the extra long route and take those few minutes to kind of switch gears to unwind before he walked in the door. Another person said for him, it, it helped to physically turn his phone all the way off when he, uh, before he walked in the door when he came home because it was just that little bit less of a temptation to, to check messages if he had to wait for his phone to turn all the way back on. So that's, that's something that helped him. And one other person suggested when you get home, actually go and change into some different clothes. Just like get into something more comfortable, kind of like Mr. Rogers. He comes in the door, you know, he takes off his jacket, he puts on his cardigan. It's like now he's in that mode. So whatever you need to do, you know, find something that helps you to kind of disengage and, and change gears. And for me, something that I uh, sometimes have to do is just not bring my laptop home. And when I do get home, like give Anna my phone. I can't actually have it on me because if I, you know, you feel that notification go off, it's like, oh, you just, it's, it's hard not to check it. So whatever you have to do, well, it might be something different. And if you have ideas, let me know because I, I need more help in this area for sure. So share those. It'd be great to encourage each other to figure out how to do this. Next, become a student of your kids. For parents, just because they are our biological kids doesn't mean that they're simply smaller versions of us. 
Each of our kids is unique. They're unique from us and from each other. And sometimes their interests are completely different than ours. So it doesn't come very naturally to us to always join in activities that they want us to do with them. Let's say, hypothetically, that you're into music and your oldest son is totally not into music. He's 100% into sports, you know, hypothetically. Um, he would rather that you go and play hockey out in the freezing cold with him or, or go and kick soccer balls at him for hours so he can practice being a goalie or serve baskets and baskets full of table tennis balls at him so he can practice his backhand flip. That's, that's probably your examples, right? That's, uh, they're all the same as ours. So, you know, that, that may not be your, your first choice of activity, but one of the blessings that we can give our kids is to enter into those activities that they want to do because it's not just the activity that they're passionate about. It's, they want to share that with who's important to them. It's who they do that activity with. So, so do those activities with your kids. And sometimes we might even learn to enjoy these foreign activities. You know, something different. I can't say that playing driveway hockey in minus 30 ever became my favorite. Um, I'm not a cold winter person. But I kind of enjoy being able to keep up with a fast-paced ping-pong rally. You know, that, at least the warm-up part where he's, you know, hitting it exactly in the same spot each time, then I can keep up, uh, and then after that, I can't. So sometimes we learn to enjoy something different. We stretch ourselves. One of the things that has helped Benji and I grow a lot closer in the last couple of years is simply being together for the long drive to Winnipeg on a Friday night when he goes to play a, a table tennis league. And, you know, it's, it's nothing fancy or complicated, but it's just that regular time that, that we spend together. You kind of even develop your own traditions, like one of our things is, is he's not into music, but he will listen to comedy. And, and musical comedy fits, so we listen to music parodies on the way to Winnipeg, and that's kind of become our thing. So secretly, I think he's actually starting to like the music. It's, you know, don't tell him that, but, but I think he might have noticed. All of us express and we receive love in different ways, including our kids. If we want to bless our kids with a sense of being loved, we also have to learn to speak their language. What, what's their love language? How do they receive love? And several years ago, our life group went through this book, The Five Love Languages of Kids. There's also adults and teens. I think there's like a version for every age group out there, but the principles are all the same. Um, it, it was really practical and helpful. So the principles are, uh, let's see, what are they? Words of affirmation, physical touch, gifts, acts of service, and quality time. And each one of us will gravitate to one or two of those as the primary way that we, we feel loved. You know, he talks about having a love bank. Um, you know, do we get filled up or depleted? And if we don't receive love in the language that, you know, comes naturally to us, someone might be trying to show how much they love us by giving us hugs and kisses, but if that's not our love language, if we, if we need words of affirmation, you know, that energy is kind of wasted. It doesn't actually fill up that person. What they need is to hear encouragement, like, oh, you did such a good job with that, or you're really good at this, you know. That, that's how they receive love. And normally we like to show love in the same language that we ourselves receive it. So if I'm a, a hugger, then I will probably tend to hug, and that's how I would show affection. But for someone else, if that's not their love language, it just it doesn't translate the same way as you're trying to show it. So learn what the love languages are of your kids. And they're not always the same either. Our two boys are very different in how they express uh, love. And so we have to customize how we treat each one of them, uh, specifically to each one of our boys. So you may have also noticed that out of these love languages, three of those overlap with the points of of blessing, of time, touch, and talk. So let's move on to the second one, touch. 
Many, if not most, of the blessings that we read about in the Bible include some kind of embrace or touch. A hug, a kiss, placing a hand on a child's head. We think about it, a large part of communication is nonverbal. So a loving touch can add so much more weight to the words that we speak. There's been a lot of examples in our society of inappropriate and harmful touch. So sometimes, you know, we may shy away from expressing love in this way, but our kids need us to model what appropriate touch is. So both our daughters and our sons. So dads, you know, hug your daughters. Teach them what honoring and respectful touch is so that they will accept nothing less from a guy they may date. And hug your sons too. They need it just as much as as the girls do, but they're actually far less likely to ever be hugged by their dads. And yes, moms, that applies to you too. You know, sometimes I think that moms don't need a reminder that they automatically are huggers, but apparently that's not the case. Sometimes we all need a reminder. And even God the Father included touch when when he blessed Jesus at, at Jesus' baptism. You know, it's not the not the usual example, but when we read it, it says this. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. So here, God, the Spirit of God, takes the physical form of a dove and lands on him. And so even there, there's an example of of a t- you know a physical touch, and Jesus in turn does the same thing when the parents are bringing little kids to him to bless them. He says, one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could bless them, or he could touch and bless them, but the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, let the little children come to me, don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the little children in his arms, placed his hands on their heads, and blessed them. Loving, appropriate touch can be very meaningful to a child. Let's go to the third point, to talk. Stephen J. Cole says... The Bible teaches that words have the power either to build up or to tear down. As someone has said, to speak of mere words is like speaking of mere dynamite. That's especially true of a father's words to his children. They're looking primarily to you for a blessing, for words that show acceptance and approval. And like we just read, Jesus experienced this in that passage A voice from heaven say, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Isn't that what every kid wants to hear from their dad? That I love you and I'm proud of you? Sometimes we forget that Jesus was fully human. He experienced all the same struggles that we have. Imagine the confidence that gave Jesus as he was about to step into three years of of ministry in public to hear the audible voice of God saying, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We need that too from our dads and our moms and our mentors. We all need reminders that kids are longing to hear those words from us. So don't be silent. Don't assume that our kids know that we love them. Say it. Don't assume that they know that we're proud of them. Tell them. Tell them what you're proud of the strength of their character, or the spiritual gifts that you see in them. It's encourage them as they're building their identity. What's the opposite of this, of silence, we might, or of talking? We might, we might think it's criticism, encouragement. We might think criticism is the opposite, but it actually would be more like silence. When you think about one of the punishments that people often use against each other in, in in their relationships, it's the silent treatment, right? That's, that's worse than getting into an argument, is just saying nothing. So don't punish your kids with silence. 
There's a story told in, in the book, The Blessing. The author says, he was in, uh, in football in high school, and he says, after I missed an important block in practice one day, a frequent occurrence, this coach stood one inch from my face mask and chewed me out six ways from Sunday. When he finally finished, he had me go over to the sidelines and sit with the players who were not part of the scrimmage, sit on the bench. Standing next to me was a third string player who rarely got into the game. I can remember leaning over to him and saying, boy, I wish he would get off my case. Don't say that, the teammate replied. At least he's talking to you. If he ever stops talking to you, that means he's given up on you. So talk to your kids. Another element of many of the spoken words of blessing that the Bible includes is a prayer for the future. These prayers were personal, taking into account their, their character and the strengths of their person and praying for a specific kind of future for them. This is something that uh, Anna and I try to do as part of our bedtime prayers for our boys or on special occasions like birthdays. We pray specific blessings for what kind of a man they will become. So pray for your kids. What kind of a man or woman will they become? What kind of character will they have? Pray for wisdom for them. And for their, their godly character, pray for who, you know, a possible future spouse of who they will have as a relationship. I don't know if there's anything prophetic in, in saying these, these blessings, but hearing encouraging words like that and how you aspire for them to do great things and how, what kind of a person they will be, you know, that, I can only imagine that will help to set them on the right course of accomplishing those sorts of things. Because when you think of the negative, a child who's only ever to been told, you're worthless or you're no good at this, well, that becomes their identity and they will live that out. So we need to do the opposite. We need to speak into our, our kids' lives of their worth. You know, these are the good things I see about you. This is what I see in your heart. This is your character. This is what I pray for your future. Then they can picture that, and they can live towards that. So those are our three main points. Time, talk, and touch. And I've got one last one to a little bonus point to wrap up with, and that's legacy. <clears throat> so, time, touch, and talk help us understand how to bless our kids, but we also need to understand why it's significant. The examples in the Bible, they're not simply focused on that parent and their child, but they're focused on multiple generations. We are impacted by our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and in turn, we will also impact not only our kids, but their kids and, you know, our great-grandkids. So the life that you impact as a mentor or a youth leader could also change the course of a child's life and also for their entire family. That could also impact generations. When Jacob was nearing the end of his life, his son Joseph and then Joseph's sons uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, they came to Jacob Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. He said to me, I will make you fruitful and will multiply your descendants. I will make you a multitude of nations and I will give this land of Canaan to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my grandfather Abraham and my father Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all the all my life to this very day, the angel who has redeemed me from all harm. May he bless these boys. May he preserve my name and the name of Abraham and Isaac. And may their descendants multiply greatly throughout the earth. Here Jacob takes the blessing that he received from God and he passes it on to his grandchildren. So our lives, they're not unaffected by our history. We're shaped by the strengths and the weaknesses of our parents and grandparents in areas like our personality and our character, but also in our faith. 
It doesn't mean that we're going to become exactly like our parents. Sometimes people react to a trait in their families that they resolve to do the opposite of, but that part was, that was still part of being shaped of, uh, you know, what they would become. So an important part of blessing our families is to parent with future generations in mind. One of the sayings I came across this week, I think it was, you know, a social media post that was going around, uh, it's actually pretty profound. If you raise your children, you spoil your grandkids, but if you spoil your, ch- your children, you raise your grandkids. Think about that one for a second. I don't know, maybe you've heard that before, but I'm thinking, that makes a lot of sense. If we only aim to provide every opportunity and remove every obstacle for our kids, then how are they going to develop the character that they need to raise their kids? About nine years ago, when Pastor Paul was chatting with me about the possibility of stepping into the youth pastor role at church here, I had a lot of reservations about it. I did not feel equipped or prepared to know what to do or what to say to impact these students' lives. Paul said something that has really stuck with me, and I've remembered it ever since. It's been an encouragement, but also a warning. He said, they probably won't remember what you say to them, but they will become who you are. That was was pretty big. It doesn't mean they're they're all going to become little versions of me, but, but who I am will impact them more than anything I say to them. So I was relieved to know that I didn't always have to have the right answer or be the best communicator. But on the other hand, it was very sobering thought that, you know, the way I live, the way I react in tough situations, or the type of person I am, that's, that would be what would stick with them. So my encouragement to you guys is just get involved. Turn off your work brain. Spend time with your kids. Hug them. Tell them what you love about them and pray for their future. Be a part of a legacy that will impact their kids and their grandkids and your great and great grandkids. So I'm gonna wrap up and ask the worship band to to come back up here and they're gonna lead us in one last song together. But as they do that, I wanna just conclude with this blessing that Jesus prays for his disciples. And that also includes us, because as we read in John 17, Jesus says, I'm praying not only for, those, or for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Why don't we all stand? Let's sing this song together. Our God is a good, good Father and he loves each one of us so much. Maybe that's something you need just to hear uh, spoken or prayed over you this morning. We have a prayer team at the front over here who would love to just spend some time with you and, and uh, hear your, uh, what you would like to be prayed for and just spend some time encouraging you. So make uh, use of that. Come and join us up here. And uh, if you want to just chat and, and, uh, and fellowship together, just use the, the back end, uh, doors there and enjoy, enjoy some coffee in the foyer. But Uh, Let's uh, make this available for anyone that wants to come for prayer and, uh, and do that. So God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Have a great week.